Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Christopher Phillips. Um, I uh, am the moderator of this session that it's going to be a collaboration between faculty and success coaches, uh, a model for student achievement with um, Heidi Kessler and uh, Michael King. Um, just for, by way of quick introduction um, for each of them, Heidi Kessler is one of the directors in the Student Achievement Collaborative and directs the work within the Office of Student Retention and Completion. Uh, Michael King uh, currently works as a case manager within the Office of Student Retention and Completion um, here at Utah State. So with that, we'll go over ahead and uh, hand it over to, to each of you. I'll keep an eye on the chat in case there are questions. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Christopher. Heidi and I are really excited to be with um, each of you today. We really feel like um, this conference and this effort that's made to put on these events is time well spent. And we're, we're hopeful that we can add to this discussion and give you an extra layer uh, of added support for our students. We know we're in a unique time and we'll have a chance to talk about that and discuss that here in just a moment. We know then and realize this is a unique time for students and a challenging time for many of them. And so we're here to hopefully help in that effort of, of adding support uh, and helping them persist to graduation. So we wanted to start out with this, with this quote of faculty, they, they play an important role here on campus. Faculty are crucial for students. They serve as instructors and mentors. They connect students with a network that will help them succeed. And then onward to future success. Um, I've been conducting my dissertation research with students here at Utah State um, and having them discuss their development of uh, here while at, at Utah State, but specifically the development of their sense of purpose. And so many of them have mentioned without any sort of prompt the role that their professors have played in helping expand their worldview, expand their horizons, and introducing them to fields that they didn't even know existed beforehand. And so we know that, that role of the instructor, the faculty mentor, are important roles that cannot be forgotten and are especially relevant today. So Michael, through, yeah, go ahead, Heidi. Let me just add, you know, um, I've I've said this often um but a student who comes here and and maybe they don't love the food or maybe they don't even love our athletics um maybe they don't find a club that they really relate to if they fall in love with what they're learning in their classes none of that ends up mattering um when students come to see me and and they're thinking about dropping out and and they've got issues if i can tap into um, a faculty member that they feel like they've made a connection with then they're willing to work through the financial problems then they're willing willing to make you know work through the roommate problems um you know finding a job all the all the other things but if i can't make that connection that they've connected with a faculty member i almost never can keep them, even if they love our athletics, even if they love the marketplace. And so um, not only are faculty important, they are the, in my estimation, the most important um, connection that students make. It is the reason that the university exists is for students to connect with faculty. Love it. Thank you, Heidi. So, and uh, these discussion points, you see them up there on the screen. And I know we're a, a smaller group today, but maybe just a few moments we can spend here and, and have a, a brief discussion. This first point here. So how has COVID-19 impacted our students? And we want to, you bring a variety of experiences with students that you work with. We're curious, what have you noticed? What have you seen? You know, it's interesting in aviation because we had to stay face to face, obviously, with our flying our maintenance labs and drone labs. So our students seem to stay pretty engaged. But what I noticed this summer, though, is after being in year, our enrollment for summer was down. A lot of people just really want to take some time off. And now that we're back to fall, I've got wait lists for a lot of my classes. So I've seen that a lot of people this summer just didn't want to work, didn't want to fly. They just wanted to take some time off, get away. But now that we're back to fall, um, our our face to face classes and we're we're bursting at the seams. So I'm have to go through and look to see. But we've got wait lists for half of our classes. So I think people are ready to come back. Um, however, I do know that um, a lot of them had some burnout of not having contact with people, and they've 
they're they're kind of fatigued with Zoom and everything. So when when we asked, you know, which class did you want to go, we actually one class we we accidentally left a Zoom class up, and the face to face was like almost full, and the Zoom class had just a few people in it. So it made sense to say, oh, that was a mistake. Let's cancel it. But uh, yeah, we're we're pretty excited. I love that. Thank you, Baron. And and I agree. Um, students absolutely felt like they and I think we all kind of felt like after after the academic year had ended coming into summer that we needed um, to come up for some air a little bit. Um, and, and I think that's a really good point. Others. Um, one of the things that that the university has done is we've done a survey. We've done a few different surveys with continuing students as well as with our incoming students. And something that's been interesting is that um, our incoming students, they don't feel like their academic experience um, was really interrupted by COVID. Um, it was made a little more difficult um, when we went when when classes went to um, online for high school, um, but they feel like they were still able to gain the material that they needed to be academically prepared. Now they may get here and find that they um, aren't quite right, but their impression is that they're academically prepared and that that the. Um, the pandemic didn't interrupt that. What they don't quite feel prepared for is leaving home, um, doing some of the adulting things that that we know are a necessary part of um, being successful academically. So making sure that they uh, have good time management skills, that they have good study skills, um, all of those things, being able to set priorities. Um, and and students are quite cognizant that they feel feel deficient in those areas. So that's one of the things that um, that this student success coaching model um, seeks to to address. So. Yeah, that's great. So then, uh, any other comments, whether it's related to this first point or our second point here? What are some of those unique academic challenges? facing today's college students. I don't know if it's unique, but uh, there's a lot of competition for their attention and they got a lot of things on their plate. So it's a, you know, it's an academic challenge to, it, 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 we, we just got this model of We'll give you as much as we can within this semester, and we just pile it on. And I'm not the only one piling it on. They've got a bunch of other teachers piling it on. So <laughs> I, I, that's a challenge. Yeah, and it's especially a challenge when we link it with these other thoughts we've been talking about, this burnout, the mental exhaustion. When you're already at a point when you're starting out at an elevated sense of burnout or exhaustion, and then that demanding of time and attention comes at a point where it's it's just too much. You know, that's something that's been on our mind a lot for this coming year. Um, our yeah, office- If, if only the students could understand how burned out I am then. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's something that's been on our mind, that, that mental exhaustion. And we have the data to reflect that they're coming in, feeling that COVID-19 has negatively impacted that overall that overall sense of health, but specifically it's added to a, a sense of, of mental exhaustion. And so our purpose here is to provide an additional layer of support, not be the be the end all or the only thing that you need to, you know, the only thing you need to be aware of, but add to the conversation of, well, what can we do to help out students? So we want to provide USU per personnel with an introduction to the student academic achievement alert, what we've just started calling the SAAA, and describe how it can be used as a tool for collaboration. So we have the Student Academic Achievement Alert. I wanted to turn the time over to Heidi for a second because um, she's been here for the whole discussion of the creation of this form, why it was created and what purpose it serves. So Heidi, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, so um, for a long time, I, I hope everybody is aware of our Student of Concern report, reporting form. And this is a form that if you feel, or anyone on campus, including students, um, feel a, a sense of concern about the well-being of a student, 
they can report that and, and know that there are trained professionals who can um, work with the students and, um, and help connect them uh, to the various services that, that can help them in that. Um, so for a long time, they would get students and they occasionally say, you know, Heidi, I think this one is, is more of um, an academic issue rather than a student of concern. And so then they just would hand those off to me. But increasingly, and then especially once the pandemic hit, um, they were getting so many um, reports where the concern was, I haven't seen this student log on for a long time or they're longing on but i don't see them or they're not turning in their assignments i don't know if i'm concerned for their well-being or not because i'm not seeing them physically anymore and so they would um faculty were were i love that faculty were genuinely concerned for their their students but not knowing um how to classify that concern they would fill out this student of concern reporting form and so we worked with, um, with those professionals to create um, kind of a counterpart form where a faculty member could say, I'm concerned about their academic well-being. And so instead of their physical, emotional, mental well-being, I'm concerned about their academic well-being. I'm not sure that they are going to persist towards these goals that they have for themselves. Um, and so we created it. It's... Um, we use the same software, which makes it really easy for us to share. And sometimes um, sometimes it, it makes sense that we both are, are helping these students. And so we're able to um, support each other, um, support the student by working together. Um, so that's kind of the history of it. It took us a while to figure out what, um, what platform to use. And we did end up to, uh, choosing to use the same platform that the Student of Concern reports are found on and so now you can find this report on the same page as the student of concern reporting form um, this is also where you you know somebody would report discrimination um, harassment any kind of um, sexual misconduct all of these forms are found on the same page um, and ours is the student academic achievement alert or the s triple a and so um, any questions kind of about the difference between these two forms? All right. So I, you know, I had I one. I didn't have a question. Oh. Sorry. Yeah, Kevin. Uh, I guess what's the threshold for, you know, making a report? Right. That not that the big, big question? And, um, it would be wonderful if we could say student exhibits in this way, then, you know, absolutely do this form. Student exhibits in this way, absolutely do that form. Um, but of course, it doesn't all work out that way. So we want you to feel very comfortable in defaulting to the form if you have concerns about their academic well-being. Um, and, and so if you're not seeing the student show up to class, you're going to be concerned about their academic well-being. Um, if the student isn't showing up to class and the last time you talk to them or their last assignment um, seem to, to um, hint at some self-harm or uh, feeling, feeling worthless or feeling, um, you know, hopeless, then that's probably a student of concern report you're saying this student was hopeless in their last assignment, mentioned some things that um, had me concerned about their well-being, and now I'm not seeing them. That makes me really fearful. So, so then you would do that. If I had a situation like that mm -hmm. and I fill out the form, do I also alert the student, hey, I'm trying to get some extra help for you? or? Um, that is really up to you. It isn't required um, for you to notify the student that that you've let us know that you're concerned about them. We really encourage you to to try to work with the student first. So you wouldn't you wouldn't do that unless I mean, my recommendation is that if you haven't seen a student for a while, you're going to reach out to them and say, hey, haven't seen you for a while. What's going on? Right. 
And then if they don't respond or they respond in a way that, uh, again, makes you concerned. Um, so, so a student might say, um, you know, I just am not understanding this, this material and I'm having a really hard time with my time management. Well, that's going to be a SAAA kind of thing where we can then help coach them through some of those things. And we, we really end up partnering um, with the faculty and with the advisors and, and so many other professionals that can address the needs of the student, the academic needs of the student. But if you reach out and say, hey, I haven't seen you for a while, where have you been? And the student doesn't respond at all, or they say, um, you know, I, I'm worthless, I'm feeling hopeless, then you might do, do the other one. Um, rest assured that if you do one and it's determined that it should have been the other, we, we will make sure it gets in the right place and we work closely with each other to make sure and, and, and when appropriate, you know, we're all working with that student. Um, and so um, we don't want faculty to feel so much pressure to get the right form that they don't do anything. Um, and, and if you fill out the form and we uh, contact the student when we find out, oh, um, you know, the, the, the student had a, a planned vacation and forgot to alert the faculty member, but they're back on track, then that's fine. We resolve that, um, that situation, that case. Um, and so our biggest thing is we want faculty to know that there are these two forms now um, when they're concerned about a student and that kind of the dividing line is, is it emotional, mental, um, physical well-being or is it their academic well-being um, that is presenting the biggest concern and then you fill out whichever form or you can fill out both forms is that helpful okay <laughs> good yeah um any other questions and we're going to go into a little bit more let's go ahead and jump to the next slide michael um, I'm going to have Michael talk through, so just like there's an entire team of social workers and healthcare workers and, and even um, uh, public safety, members of public safety that, that help with the student of concern, we have a team and they meet weekly to discuss the various cases that come in. And, and I'll let Michael tell you about each of these individuals on this team. Yeah, so the idea here is to let you know and inform instructors, well, what even happens with that form once it's once it's submitted is um, it'll be compiled and, and we meet together as this group. We have a weekly case uh, consultation meeting or a case assignment meeting where we go over the reports that have been submitted and the information there. Uh, and like Heidi mentioned, it very much resembles uh, the CARES and BIT team, their process as well of looking at the situation, what information we have, and then moving forward of making the assignment uh, of who's the best, who's the best uh, prepared and best fit for working with the student. So, um, so I'm right there in the middle. So I work as overseeing the efforts with student outreach. We have a whole arm of, of the efforts that we do trying to reach out to students when we have information to suggest that they may be at risk or there are academic difficulties. That's kind of one arm of what feeds the referrals that we have, but then there's this SAAA form that feeds a lot of um, a lot of the students that we work with, uh, providing us those names. So we actually also have Charity Maeda who works with us, and she's just fantastic. She oversees our supplemental instruction uh, as well as our Aggie for Scholars program. So when the students and part of her time, I don't know how she fits in this in her schedule, but um, a significant amount of her time is spent in this in this coaching and academic outreach role as well. Uh, and specifically, oftentimes the cases that we send her way are those first generation university students because that's her wheelhouse. That's exactly what she does. But then also our um, BIPOC students, those that identify as BIPOC, they get sent charities direction as well uh, because she's connected so well to a lot of those resources. And I think I'll just mention here that that's kind of one of our main responsibilities at this point is we don't want to just leave everything on the on the shoulders of the faculty of like we want you to connect them with the perfect resource and make sure that it works we want um, faculty members to feel empowered that they can send us these referrals and that we're going to help broker that success we're going to connect the students with what um, with those resources that are the best fit 
And we're also in this kind of a new and exciting collaboration that we're trying to put together with statewide. So Andrea Olding is really, has been fantastic in helping us understand their process, how we might be able to um, use this report and make it fit within their system and within their process. And overall, how can we just help those students that are out in Moab or some other corner of, but still within our system, how we might be able to best um, support those efforts. So in this weekly meeting, we, we cover those reports, what's been um, submitted to our office, and really go from there of um, what's the best, uh, best course of action for these students. And oftentimes that's individual outreach. So if I get a report that comes to me, I'm oftentimes trying to connect with the student and see, well, let's, let's just chat. Let's have an opportunity to sit down. So in Kevin, in one of your questions earlier, I think um, speaks to this idea of, well, uh, do I let the student know that they're coming or how do I do this? And I think it depends on situation, but I think where there's an opportunity to kind of warm that student up to outreach will be happening just as an extra support to you that's going to increase our likelihood of getting a response from that student a whole lot. I don't have any data to suggest how much that might be, but just from personal experience, whenever there's been like a type of warm-up conversation of, hey, this we're going to submit this form because of this situation that you're going through. This is just to make sure that the university is supporting you. We have resources to help students in this situation. This form in no wise means that you, it in no way means that you're in trouble or that you failed or that you're, you know, you're marked um, by in terms of the university standards. This is just to make sure we do our due diligence to connect you with resources that are available to you. Um, so if a student can be primed to that conversation, we're a whole lot more likely to see um, uh, something good happen as a result and have a response from that student. So if a student just comes to me and, and they've got uh, big concerns and family issues going on and just they're just really feeling at their limit, then a referral to you you may help them directly, you may help them find resources or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's really those things that are interrupting academics. You know, so to Heidi's point earlier that if it's significant, we're worried about safety, we're worried about wellness, we're worried about, you know, their well-being. That fits more with a student of concern form. But if it if it is these other issues, it's like I'm just stressed, like I, I'm not quite sure how I how I should be managing my time or my skills to do well in this class they're just not there. I mean, those, it's going to vary by situation. And I think that Heidi's point is a great one of, even if it's technically with the wrong group, uh, we've tried to build a great collaboration with their office. So if it's like, you know what, I feel like this is a better fit. Or if something progresses in the situation, it's like, oh, this is really a cares type of, of, of report. Uh, we're not going to have any gripes with the faculty, you know, in that type of situation, we're just going to be grateful the form was submitted. So um, a form being submitted is, is, is best case. So we, we really appreciate that whenever it is submitted. Um, right. Heidi, anything you'd add to, to this or Kevin, any other questions? Okay, so then let's, I, and I know we've got about maybe five, six minutes left. We wanted to just put these scenarios um, up here on the slide, these, so I've, I've worked in a um, adjunct role as well. So I've tried to take these from actual situations that I've had with students um, and names have been replaced with the names of my children. <laughs> um, that's just kind of an easy thing for me to just put their names in there. Um, but they resemble or kind of a compilation of, of different situations. So Heidi, any, uh, do you want us, um, what do you think? Should we just focus on, on one? Should we let people choose which one they have in the time that we have left? Or what would your thoughts be? I'm wondering, you know, I think we can just kind of have everybody look through these. And, and I think, you know, the, the bottom line is in these situations, these are, these are all real situations, real life situations that, that students can face. Um, and in every case, they would be um, benefited by having um, some time with a student success coach. And, um, you know, this is not meant to, to be for one population of students versus another population of students. These success coaches can meet with, with all students. And, it, you know, the student um, that meets at 9 a.m. might be a 4.0 student, and the student who meets at 4.30 might be a, a 2.0 student, and, and all will benefit um, from, from these discussions. So I think that's the biggest takeaway on this. And as you've had a chance to look through them, does, you know, are there, 
things any of you want to bring up. Rebecca, we have not heard from you. <laughs> Do you have anything you want to say about any of these? Hi, um, <laughs> no, I'm kind of just listening, so mm -hmm. drinking information. So thanks for asking. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, yeah, Kevin or Baron or anyone in the room with Baron, do you have insights in these? Or you know, this is real interesting comparing it to some other uh, sessions I had today. Um, some of the other sessions were talking about choice and flexibility and mental wellness and inclusive design, you know, and it, it was talking about being flexible and adaptable. And, you know, the whole time I'm thinking about, you know, the FA standards, we have very specific exams they have to take and pass. So I don't have some of the flexibility and, and yet we still want to have compassion and understanding. Um, and so when I was reading these scenarios here, I do hit some of these every semester. I've, I've got one or two students that reach out to me and I sit down with them and we talk. A lot of time it's their first year away from home or they've had some tragedy like a death in the family. Sometimes it is they lost their job and they don't know how they're gonna pay for school. And so, you know, being able to understand whether it's a skill problem or a will problem is the first challenge, you know? And once we can figure that out, then that gives us a starting point of what we can do and where, where we go with that. And so I found uh, quite often that, you know, when, when you look at these extensions, if there's a valid reason why they had a challenge, um, and this is my game face. I'm not sure if you all think I'm red and blue striped, but I'm not sure what's going on with my Zoom today. Do you guys see me as red and blue too? Or Yeah. Um, but anyway, so my camera's been geeking up. But, you know, a lot of times, it, just the effort of reaching out to them, the students feel better. And, and, and tell me, hey, let's work one-on-one. -on -one. Let's try to work with this here. And I tell them partial credit is better than no credit. And I had two students last semester in the spring who were struggling. One of them was able to work their grade up to a C minus and the other one got it up to a B plus. But just because I reached out to them and, and made an effort, they didn't need professional help. They didn't need a lot. All they needed was a little bit of attention and effort. And I had one student who I did re refer to some academic success because they were really struggling with their first year in college. They started mid-semester in January, so they didn't really connect with people. All the cliques and clubs had formed last fall, and so they really felt disconnected. And that one was a little bit harder, you know, um, to try to have, have this person get involved in school. And then I had one girl who all her classes were online, and she felt no connection and no motivation. And so I talked to her and she, um, uh, two weeks later, I found out when I talked to her again, she goes, oh, I decided to take a yoga class just so I could be one class in person because otherwise she never left her dorm room. She never left her room. And now that she, it forces her to get out and to get going. And so, you know, there's no one size fits all. You have to look at every one of these scenarios and individuals and adapt to make sure that they understand that you care and that, that, uh, that you can do what you can for them. I've been very fortunate not having to refer people to more serious challenges. So I've been very fortunate, but I do know that there are many resources on campus available for and when somebody has additional needs that I can't handle. Oh, those are, those are excellent examples, Baron. And you are an excellent example of, of someone who, um, you know, shows by example how to get involved and um, and to truly care about students, and that's that makes all the difference. I think every every person who's been successful in college, which I'm guessing is everyone on this, um, can look back and and think about a faculty member that saw something in us, you know, that gave us gave us hope in ourselves and encouragement in ourselves, and really that is the key. Um, and we're here uh, to back you up. We're here to to help teach some specific skills and all of that. But you are exactly right. It's that caring that that makes the biggest difference. Thank you, Michael. We are about there on time. If there's any last questions or, or summary you guys want to do to kind of wrap things up. Yeah, I think we can, we really like this, um, like this conversation. I won't read through this slide just to emphasize we've got exciting things to come. 
basically it comes down to additional collaborations and more hands on deck. And that's exciting for us to kind of extend our reach even further. And then really the take home message is we've got a challenge ahead of us of how do we help, you know, Baron, you, you, I mean, you laid it out beautifully what some of those common concerns are, but we're up to the task. I think USU is, um, we can set the standard. We can show the rest of, um, we can show other universities how this can effectively be done. And I think, um, we can do it, we're up to the task. What it will require of us is deliberate outreach. It'll take a knowledge of the referral process, what we talked about today, you know, the SAAA being one of those potential forms. And also a, a general knowledge of campus resources. Do you need to know every single one of them? No, but the more you know, the more you're able to refer these students to them. And um, the use of these forms is one of those resources. And then collaboration, that continued work. Um, with one another. So in the spirit of, of that, here's our, our addresses, our email addresses. If you ever have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us directly. You know, if you have, hey, I've got the situation, is this form a good fit? Or here's what I'm, you know, here's what I'm seeing, what might I do in this situation? I think, I don't want to speak for Heidi, but I think those are our favorite type of communications to have with faculty and instructors, as because I, because you care enough to ask the question, and we love to help out in those types of situations. So and we really want to say thank you for sticking out with us um, this last session here today. We know these conference presentations, the days can seem pretty long. So we really appreciate you sticking it out with us here. Thank you so much, uh, Heidi and Michael. And we'll leave this room open if anybody has questions or if you want to stick around for a little bit. But sure appreciate your uh, presentation today and to everyone for attending the conference. Um, recordings of all of the sessions will be made available. I'm sure there'll be some email communications will go out so you can rewatch and um, uh, follow up with any of the presenters you have questions on. Thank you so much for being here today.